I was interested, Matt, in your written evidence. You, um, you talked about some of those challenges in terms of local authorities, and you said um, the centre system is still incapable of channeling this funding in ways that meet needs lawfully. They had money to change their ways of working, and they blew it, from your evidence. I wonder if you could explain that in a little bit more detail. Yes, yeah, so that evidence was um, analysis that, that I did for Special Needs Jungle on the, the sums of money that were allocated um, not for the front line, but for the process of implementing the reform. So it's hard to get an overall figure for that. We estimated um, minimum 550 million, more like 600 million um, in reality. Um, through a process of FOI requests and um, checking council payments data, uh, we managed to track 70% of that spending. Uh, some local authorities were unable to account for it and it appeared that the for a grant that was delivered to to enable system change um, a surprisingly small percentage of that was spent on training we we tracked out of 140 million pounds of spending over four years we were able to track um, 1.5 percent 2.3 million was spent on training for a system that required um, one part of a new Act of Parliament, two statutory instruments, a 300-page code of practice, um, and various different uh, ways in which the administration of SENDS um, and the understanding of new statutory responsibilities had to be delivered. Um, one of the things I sort of do in my spare time is, is help parents, principally parents of deaf children who are in or have been in my situation and exactly the same issues um, of difficulty in, in acquiring the support our children need happen for exactly the same reasons that they happened under the 1996 Education Act set up. It appears that at least at ground and operational level there appears to be very little change in the way um, special educational needs administration works. And it seems, surpri it seems surprising to me, A, that that much money had been provided with no ring fencing, no meaningful effort to ascertain impact. Do you basically say this money was wasted? This 500, 600 million pounds I think if, if its initial... It, ambition was to enable the process of change from one legal system to another and also as I remember Edward Timpson saying at the, the time to enable a process of culture change that puts the child or young person with special educational needs at the heart of the process yes I would say that money has probably been wasted. There have been some interesting innovative things that have been done with that money. Cornwall for example used several thousand pounds to set up a young people send board to help hold uh, local decision makers to account. Um, but by and large, um, I would say it, it, it has not been spent as well as it could. And certainly the same training issue seems to come up again and again. Thelma. Um, I had a delegation of parents come to see me in my advice surgery some time ago who had special needs um, children. Um, and each of them said that they decided to homeschool because they had waited so long um, to have education and healthcare plans put in place. One parent spoke about her child being so vulnerable and so stressed and so distressed um, that he started self-harming and she said she just couldn't face what he was going through because the wait was so long. Um, so could I ask, what impact do delays in local authorities undertaking the EHCP assessments or producing the plans have on families, on children um, and on funding for schools, um, Justin? It, it has a huge effect. I mean, we did some survey work of parents this year. <clears throat> Sorry, we did some survey work of parents this year and 40% of them said they'd waited over 18 months for an EHC plan where it should be 20 weeks. Um, so, it, and that is partly because local authorities do not have the expertise anymore to do their job because they don't have staff. But the other point is they're using the EHC process as a gatekeeper to that money. So if you don't get 
the, and the HC plan, you don't get funding from the HC, from the high needs funding, from the top up funding. So if you make parents wait as long as possible, you're keeping your budget <coughs> into the And they know that most of the local authorities know that if they give a new HC plan, they haven't got any money to fund it because it's needs based and the parents know how much money they should be getting. Parents can ask for personal budget. <coughs> they will know, if they do that, how much the local authority should be providing for their child. So they do push parents a lot of the time to go to appeals and tribunals. They push them all the time. They say you need a diagnosis first when you don't. When you've got a diagnosis, they'll say that you need an assessment. They'll string it out as long as possible sometimes. Not all local authorities. Some of them do within the 20 weeks very well. And there is a big disparity between... There is actually a statistic in the um, Department of Justice actually have it for how many decisions a local authority made on SEN and how many were appealed by that decision. And there's a lot of different rates between local authorities. Some of them have a very high rate of appeals per decision, which basically means they're misusing the system. And that does happen. And it's a cost implication. Um, most of the children who are in our schools need to be in those schools to learn. They have a level of need that can only be met in a special school, usually because they need such high staffing numbers or they need specialist support. However, we're increasingly seeing quite a lot of children who could have stayed in mainstream if they hadn't have been off-rolled or excluded or missed a large amount of education for other reasons. Yes. And that's becoming increasingly common. Um, but the proportion, if you look at children with autism, the proportion who are in mainstream is 70%. It's 70% now. It was 70% in 2010. It's the same. What has happened is there are more and more children coming through the system, which is why we're seeing more and more children in special schools, simply because there are more and more children who need this help. And that's part of the problem. The funding hasn't followed the rise in the numbers, and so more children are going into special provision because it's the only way of getting help. Do you think more children are putting those provisions almost as a, in support in terms of learning difficulties or even, I mean, I've seen in my own constituency, I don't know whether this carries, um, but also behavioural difficulties. It's almost used as a, an alternative provision. Um, I think we're seeing press as an alternative provision as well as part of this. I think we're seeing more and more children falling out of the mainstream system that need a place in a school somewhere whether that's alternative provision or a specialist school. Um, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that special schools are there to provide an education for children who can't be in mainstream, and there are always going to be some of those children. So you've got to get that balance right. Um, just the exper my personal experience and my family's experience and that of families who, who attend my school is... Um, it's a non-maintained special school, um, anywhere between 60, sometimes 80% of those decisions go uh, contested, go to a special educational needs and disability tribunal. Um, and last year, 100% um, of those decisions went in favour of the parents. It seems to me at least, uh, you know, very, very much a resource driven decision for the obvious pressures that everyone's discussed today um, and much less a needs driven one one of the main you know tensions in the system is the same pe the same public body that assesses need is the one that also has a duty then to meet that need and I think within specialist provision particularly the the more sp um, complex end of it those decisions end up more in a tribunal situation than most. And you mentioned that particularly around uh, non-maintained schools. I have an example in my own constituency, uh, Real Education, who are um, an independent school mm -hmm. by all accounts, and they um, have told me they consider themselves kind of lumped in with people like Eton and Harrow, actually, in terms of funding and the support that they get, uh, when it's a totally different, obviously, scenario. Um, do you think there's a, a more of a challenge for an independent school in that sector to access funding or to, to convince local authorities to put children into that provision given the probably additional cost? Yes, um, to some extent those, th those challenges are deserved because local authorities have to you know, use resources efficiently. So, um, and the, you know, to some extent, you know, I think the Lenehan Review 
that, that took place last year um, asked some quite pointed questions about just why some of those um, annual fees were so high. I have no idea what they would be for real education. The longer term issue for us would be, you know, I've got two teenager lads. Um, they're having been told they never get GCSEs. They're now on a path to university. They'll, you know, they, they will pay that money back financially and socially. You know, in, in spades, you look at, I guess you, you look at the, the investment from them.